Now we're going to talk about equilibrium in the addition uh, of water to carbonyls. Remember I said that uh, addition, these addition reactions are reversible processes. And we see that um, carbonyl compounds are then in equilibrium with their hydrates when placed into water. Okay, So this is very important to understand that the reaction can go um, both ways. A hydrate uh, can go back to the carbonyl and then vice versa. Now where that equilibrium lies is going to vary depending on the substituents that are attached to that carbonyl. And we can, um, we can see this by um, thinking about you know, what kind of carbonyls um, uh, have different types of hydrates and what's the equilibrium. So I'm going to start off and draw a little table where I have uh, different carbonyls, their hydrates, uh, the K, the equilibrium constant of going from the carbonyl to the hydrate, and then what that means in terms of the percent of hydrate that actually exists in water. So what happens when I put a carbonyl uh, into water, how much hydrate do I have, right? And so I start off um, with the simplest uh, carbonyl, namely formaldehyde. When I put formaldehyde in water, the hydrate of formaldehyde is this, right? So this is formaldehyde hydrate. And the equilibrium constant of the hydrate is 2300. Now what does this mean? That means that when I put formaldehyde into water, 2300 molecules of hydrate are formed for every one molecule of formaldehyde. And so essentially, I don't have formaldehyde in water. Whenever you're using, if you ever get it, an opportunity, which is rare because formaldehyde um, is fairly um, toxic to us. One of the reasons for that is because it easily forms this hydrate, and this hydrate bonds very strongly to DNA. And so it causes all sorts of mutagenesis and all different types of problems that we've discovered over the past 15 years or so. And therefore, um, it becomes a lot more difficult uh, to use formaldehyde unless you're fixing cells. And so we see that the percent of hydrate is 99.96%. That's a pretty good percentage relative to um, what we started, the aldehyde that we start with. So uh, obviously the aldehyde is not very stable in water. Formaldehyde is not very stable in water. So the next one I'm going to look at is, well, what happens if I exchange a hydrogen with a methyl group, right? What happens to that equilibrium. Well, the hydrate of this uh, is CH3CHOH2. So again, we're getting a geminal diol. And the K for this one is 1, right? Now, what does that mean? For every one um, acetaldehyde molecule, I have one hydrate when I place acetaldehyde in water. And therefore, the percentage of hydrate is 50%. I have 50% of the acetaldehyde hydrate and 50% of the acetaldehyde. Notice there's a quite a bit of a, a, quite a big difference between um, the amount of hydrate when I put acetaldehyde in water and the amount of hydrate when I put formaldehyde in water. And so obviously, that methyl group is slowing down the rate or the reaction of hydration. So let's see what happens when I put another methyl group on. Now I have a ketone, right? This is acetone, CH3C, double bond O, CH3, so propanone, acetone. And the hydrate of acetone looks like this, right? Two methyl groups on a carbon and two OH groups on the carbon. The equilibrium constant for acetone is 0 0.002. What does this mean? When I put acetone in water, only 0 0.002 molecules of acetone actually form the hydrate. 
the remainder, remainder is acetone itself. And so the percentage of the hydrate is only 0.002%, a very small percentage, which means that acetone is fairly stable in water. When I add that second methyl group, now the stability of the carbonyl um, is greatly enhanced relative to that of the aldehydes. Now, why is this? Well, let's think about what happens if I put a CF3 group on. I know CF3, the fluorines are highly electronegative, so they withdraw electron density. We know that alkyl groups, in general, donate electron density through an inductive effect and hyperconjugation. So what if I have these um, CF3 groups where their electron withdrawing? The hydrate of, um, this is um, uh, uh, trifluoro, um, I'm sorry, uh, hexafluoroacetone, right? Hexafluoroacetone. Um, and the hydrate of hexafluoroacetone is this. And we see that the K is astronomical, 22,000. What does that mean in terms of the percentage of hydrate? Essentially, that means that 100% of hexafluoro hexafluoroacetone, when placed in water, is going to form the hydrate. All right? So let's look at the overall picture of this. We see that when the R groups connected to the carbonyl are electron donating, then hydration is reduced. The amount of hydration is reduced. But when R groups are electron withdrawing, hydration is increased. Why is this? Well, let's take a look at um, our generic carbonyl, where we have R groups um, attached to the carbon. We know that uh, the carbon is, has a partial positive charge, the oxygen has a partial negative charge, there's a dipole moment that's moving in the direction of the oxygen. We know that the LUMO um, is, uh, has a lot of carbon 2p character, and that that carbon is the Lewis acid. Um, it accepts electrons. Now, when the R groups are electron donating, what happens? Well, they're stabilizing that carbon because the carbon is accepting electrons from um, the R groups that are attached to it. The net effect is that the carbon has reduced electrophilicity, right? Its Lewis acid character decreases because it's not really wanting to accept any more electrons because it's able to accept electrons from um, inductively through the um, groups that are already attached to it, right? Now, on the other hand, again, painting a picture here where the carbonyl um, is polar, oxygen's withdrawing electron density away from the carbon, the carbon takes on a partial positive charge. Now what happens if the R groups are electron withdrawing? Now I have, again, um, the, the carbon is taking on even more of uh, electron deficiency. So its Lewis uh, acid characteristic is increasing. Or we could say that this increases the electrophilicity. So electron withdrawing groups decrease or reduce electrophilicity of the carbon, and electron withdrawing groups increase the electrophilicity of that carbon. Let's take a look at what benzene does. We see that benzene as a substituent of a carbonyl reduces hydration. And why is this? Well, <clears throat> here I have benzaldehyde and I can draw a resonance structure of benzaldehyde, right, where I donate a pair of electrons from the ring to that carbonyl, and the uh, carbon-oxygen bond breaks and the electrons go to the oxygen. The result is this particular resonance structure, right, where now the oxygen has a negative charge, uh, but the positive charge, notice, is going away from the carbonyl carbon and onto the ring itself. And of course, I can draw other resonance structures of this where uh, that positive charge can be delocalized through the ring. So I have this 
particular resonance structure. And of course I can do it again, donating a pair of electrons into there, and I get the last resonance structure. And so because of that, because the positive charge is being taken away from the carbonyl carbon, again, the idea is when that happens, you're reducing the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon, and therefore water, the nucleophile, isn't going to, is going to be less likely to attack it. And hence it stabilizes that carbonyl carbon toward nucleophilic attack.